EU foreign affairs ministers had a lot on their plate when they met on Monday. Potential sanctions against Russia over the detention of opposition leader Alexei Navalny was top of the agenda. They also discussed de-escalating tensions with Turkey. Following the talks, Euronews sat down with Greece and Hungary's foreign ministers to discuss what next for the EU on the most pressing issues. You have been in Moscow last Friday. Did you demand the release of Mr. Navalny? We had uh, very important bilateral issues on the agenda. I had to negotiate uh, about uh, purchasing uh, vaccines from Russia since uh, our national regulator has approved the uh, emergency use authorization for the uh, vaccine produced by the Russians. And on the other hand, I had to secure the gas supply of the country for the future given the fact that our long-term gas purchase agreement is going to expire uh, during the autumn. So we had very important bilateral issues on the agenda and uh, my negotiations were only about bilateral issues. When you talk about the gas issue, many people here in Brussels says that Germany should simply stop the Nord Stream 2 project because of the issue of Mr. Navalny. Do you think this is a realistic scenario? Well, I think we should leave this issue to Germany uh, to, uh, to discuss and uh, decide. What I know for sure is that uh, the diversification when it comes to gas supply of Europe, be it diversification of routes or diversification of sources, uh, is uh, important. Gas still plays a very important role in the uh, energy supply of the entire uh, continent. Now with the presidency of Joe Biden, we will have a new era in the Hungarian-American relations. Hungary was one of the few countries that openly supported uh, Donald Trump. Prime Minister Orban said uh, that he has no plan B. Does the Hungarian government have a plan B now? It's absolutely not, not an exaggeration to say that between 2016 and 2020, we had the best ever political relationship between the two countries. And that was mostly due to the very good personal relationship between the former president of the United States and the prime minister uh, of, uh, of Hungary. What we hope now for is that the standards of this political relationship will remain as high as it used to be in the recent uh, four years. You also criticized personally Joe Biden and his son, if I remember well. You called for the clarification of alleged uh, corruption issues in the Ukraine. Do you regret this? I think when you uh, quote things, you have to be punctual. Because what happened was the following. I didn't criticize anybody because uh, it's not my job to discuss the quality of the candidates uh, for presidency of any other countries. Now, President um, uh, Biden criticized uh, Hungary and was calling Hungary as an autocratic uh, country, uh, which I think uh, shows kind of um, lack of respect and lack of uh, trust uh, towards a country. Well, it happened in the election campaign, so that uh, might be explained by the fact that uh, in election campaigns things are being said which are not said afterwards. Uh, but, but obviously, uh, we have called for uh, more respect uh, towards Hungary uh, in, this, in this regard, and, and, and we are pretty sure that, uh, that if, um, if the new president would like to deal with, uh, with Central Europe, uh, uh, then we are ready to cooperate uh, with him. Now, you are also in charge in the Hungarian government for purchasing anti-COVID vaccines from outside of the EU. And you are criticizing the Brussels common vaccine strategy very harshly. This is not a secret. But I would like to know, would Hungary be better off without the common vaccine strategy competing with Germany, France and other countries? What I see is the following. Uh, the producer, which has been prioritized by the European Union very heavily, is delivering more vaccines to US, to UK and to Israel compared to the EU member states. This is a fact. And I think it, it needs at least to be explained to a certain extent. While expectations were hyped very high, and now we see that the deliveries are much slower and they contain much less vaccine than they were supposed to, do, uh, supposed to be so, still some European institutions and bureaucrats continue to attack countries which are looking for different um, or, or alternative sources uh, in this regard. For us, vaccine is not a political question. For us, vaccine is not a matter of ideology. It's a matter of life of the people, which we have to save.
That's why we negotiated with the Russians because, because, or we agreed with the Russians because our national regulator has approved the emergency um, use authorization, has given the emergency use authorization uh, for, the, for the Russian vaccine in Hungary. Who will have the liability for the use of the Russian vaccine? Look, uh, our national regulator has looked into the vaccine, well, physically and, uh, and virtually as well. As uh, we have received, I mean, they have received samples. They have paid visits to the places uh, where these vaccines are being uh, produced. They have studied the documentation and they have given uh, their uh, approval. Look, I understand that everybody would like to speak about philosophical questions, but uh, since, the, um, uh, since the national regulator has given the approval based on the documentation, I guess including the possible side effects as well, myself as a politician could do nothing else than make the agreement uh, with the Russians. So scientific questions should be left for those who are trained for that. Let's change topic because... Uh... Last December, the European Union approved finally the next seven years budget. And there is a new tool attached to it, which is called rule of law mechanism. Do you think because of this, Hungary will get less European funds? No, I mean, why should we? We have no problem with, uh, <coughs> with conditions uh, of rule of law. And we have no problem with conditions of democracy because we are a democracy. And, uh, and rule of law applies in Hungary very clearly. Why, uh, so why did Hungary veto? Because of our experience. Because of our experience. Because what happened since we have been in office is that we are under attack based on political and ideological issues, but they are called rule of law, which have nothing to do with rule of law issues. We are under attack because what we think about migration. We are under attack because what we think about family. We are under attack because what we think about patriotism. It has nothing to do with rule of law. We are under attack continuously because of political reasons. Because because what we are doing is simply undigestible for the international liberal mainstream. Because we represent a patriotic approach, a Christian democratic approach, and in the meantime, we are successful. So 25 member states supported this mechanism. Are they all parts of this liberal mainstream? You know, I, I never commented on, on positions of other countries because I think it's well above uh, mutual respect. I respect their position. I respect that they look at this issue from a different angle. They have not been under attack uh, for the last 11 years. Uh, and I understand that they have a different uh, approach to that. I, I never commented on that. And I think they have the right to do so, as, as we do have the right to exercise veto in this regard. Because exercising veto in this issue and in other issues is being secured or being laid uh, uh, down as a foundation in the <laughs> Treaty of the European Union. So, I mean, challenging the right of ours to discuss Challenging the right of ours to, uh, uh, to go into a debate is very anti-democratic, I think. Peter Siarto, thank you very much. I appreciate it as well. So joining me now here in Brussels is the Greek Foreign Minister, Mr. Nikos Denzias. First of all, despite the calls from some member states, including the Baltic states or Poland, the EU Foreign Minister decided to hold off from imposing new sanctions on Russian officials over the detention of Alexei Navalny. Do you agree with this approach? How should Europe treat Russia at this stage? Well, we have agreed with the uh, position of the huge majority of member states as expressed by Josep Borrell. That is that we should give a chance to Russia to reconsider. And after 30 days, we're going to discuss the issue again. That's where we are. Talking now about uh, sanctions, uh, the sanctions discussed for months over the illegal activities of Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean still remain on hold despite the political decision by the EU Council in December. And we heard clearly the German Foreign Minister saying that this new positive atmosphere recently created by the Turkish side shouldn't be burdened by new sanctions. Do you think that this atmosphere created right now justifies this uh, taking sanctions off the table? Well, if you allow me to say, sanctions were not in the table to be taken off the table. Of course, uh, Heiko, Heiko Ma said exactly what you said, but sanctions were not discussed yet in this. They were not on the agenda. What we were discussing was current affairs. And current affairs, as you very rightly said, was the description of the huge change in the Turkish policy from gunboat diplomacy to some sort of uh, effort to persuade everybody that Turkey is becoming 
and normal interlocutor and is going to discuss with us on the basis of international law. Well, let us wait and see what the Turks are going to do. So you say that they are still on the table? The European Union says that they are on the table. And the European Union hopes that they will not be implemented. And the way for them not to be implemented is to Turkey to abide by international law. Don't you see a risk there that maybe Turkey takes what they want with this, you know, attitude of positiveness towards the EU and finally go back to what it was before? Well, let us hope that uh, President Erdogan and my friend Mavlut Cavusoglu see clearly where is uh, the interest of the Turkish society. And I'm one of the people who believe that the true interest of the Turkish society and of Turkey itself is good relations with the European Union. And maybe, who knows, sometime in the future to become members of the European Union. But that means closer relations and full subscriptions to the European acquis. But please allow me to remind that European acquis consists also of FUNCLOS, of the International Convention of the Law of the Sea. So Turkey has eventually to subscribe to that. And now we're coming to the exploratory talks that uh, resumed uh, for the first time after five years. Good. Uh, so I would like to ask you, what is your realistic expectation from this? Well, I, I have to agree with, with everybody saying it's an important step, but if you allow me to say it's not a big step. Exploratory talks are not negotiations. Are talks in ambassadorial level which try to define the terms of references in order to have real negotiations. So that was the first meeting after five years by the way, let us be frank, it was Turkey that stopped the meetings back in 2016, not Greece, as Turkey claims. But of course, that's okay, let's go beyond that. The, the important is that they have resumed. Now, this was the first meeting. I understand that it was just a meet again meeting. We'll see where we go from there. What are your red lines in this process? Well, it's, uh, l l let, us, let, let us not define an argument by red lines, or, but, and let's try to, 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 to see the positive the positive uh, side of things. Well, Turkey has decided, after all, that gunboat diplomacy leads to nothing. And they return to an effort to achieve an understanding with Greece, with Cyprus, with the European Union. I hold this as something extremely important and hope that we can build upon it. And in this context, you said that uh, recently, last week, Greece extended its territorial waters towards the West and the Ionian Sea. And of course, that it's planning to do so uh, also in the East. Uh, do you still insist on that, despite, of course, the warnings that we renewed warnings from Turkey over a military action, if so? Well, uh, I have to say that uh, this was announced by Prime Minister Mitsotakis back in August 2020. And extending the territorial waters of a country is its own right statement, not the right that it has to negotiate with anybody else. So this is a sovereign right of Greece, and Greece will exercise it whenever the Greek government thinks it's the proper time and also, apart from that, is not going to negotiate on that basis with Turkey or, for that matter, with anybody else. As we speak about these differences that Greece has uh, with uh, Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean, of course, we're mainly focusing on the exploration of natural resources. And we've seen that Greece has made uh, many agreements with several players in the region, including Israel, uh, Egypt, etc. Does this mean that Greece can move on this without Turkey? But we don't want to exclude Turkey from anything. Yeah, this, this is, uh, this is absolutely wrong, rather than exactly the opposite. We want to involve Turkey in everything, but under a set of rules. And which are those rules? The rules of international law. Greece would love to have a cordial, mutually beneficial relation with Turkey. I think that's a way forward for Greece, that's a way forward for Turkey, that's a way forward for everybody. We're looking now beyond our continent, uh, Europe. It's a, a new change in the United States with the new administration. We know that Erdogan just lost one very good friend from the White House. Does this mean for you that now the new administration will be more favorable for Greece's interests? Well, we're not looking to, to favors from, from the new American administration. And uh, uh, speaking about the friendship between President Trump and President Erdogan, I have to say that Greece has no problems at all with, with Secretary Pompeo, right? The opposite. Secretary Pompeo had a huge understanding of the problems in the region, and whatever he has tried to do, I think, was perceived very positively from the Greek side. And the new Biden administration consists of people that have a deep knowledge in the Balkans, a deep knowledge of uh, Southeastern Europe, and they know what 
is the situation on the ground. So we are looking very much forward on working with them, not because, we, again, I'm repeating myself, we're expecting favours for them, but because working with people that know the region, know the area, would be extremely helpful in resolving the existing differences. And we heard uh, repetitively many EU officials, EU leaders, saying that they want to coordinate in foreign policy with the new administration in this new era of transatlantic relations. What does this mean for you? Well, let, let us be frank. It is very important that the European Union and the United States are on the same page. After all, we believe in the same rules and the same principles. So it is very important that we come closer together. And whatever differences existed, we try to resolve those problems and move forward together. There's a deep understanding between the United States and the European Union, and I have to say this is something on which we can build upon. Okay, Minister, thank you very much thank for you. this interview.